Hello and welcome to the program. I am Deji Badimasi and today we are discussing quite a number of issues because um, it's been a very dramatic week in Nigeria, especially in the state of Adama, where that dramatic development took place uh, just a couple of... Uh, early this week, as a matter of fact, we had, um, well, an acting governor and now things have changed. We have a substantive uh, governor in place. As a matter of fact, the former deputy governor of the state is now the governor of Adama State. I'm talking about Bala James Ngilari. And as you all know, he became governor after the federal high court in Abuja ordered that he be sworn in as governor. And uh, the court, of course, ordered that uh, the acting governor, Omar Fintari, who has actually gone back to being a speaker, should vacate his position. So quite dramatic development. And, um, you know, a lot of people have been talking about it. And that's where we're going to start our discussion from. And I'm being joined on the program today by uh, Liberos Oshoma, who is here in the studio with me. And uh, somewhere in Lagos, we're being joined by uh, GT Ogunye, also a lawyer. They would all be weighing in on this issue and some other dramatic uh, developments we've had, we've had actually in Nigeria over the past week. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on the program. Let me start with you, uh, GT Ogunye. Tell me, are you shocked by, were you in any way surprised by the decision of the, the federal high court ordering the swearing in of uh, Bala Ngelari as the governor of the state? I was not surprised uh, by the decision of the federal high court uh, uh, of uh, Ademola J, Justice Ademola. Uh, because when you take a hard look at the provision of the Constitution, and I'm talking about Section 306, uh, Subsection 1, 2, and 5 uh, of uh, that provision, uh, it becomes crystal clear that uh, when a deputy governor is to resign uh, under his own hand, he has to submit his letter of resignation uh, to the governor. And in this case, uh, the purported letter of resignation submitted by the then deputy governor, uh, Bala James Ngilari, who is now the substantive governor, was submitted to uh, the Speaker of the House of Assembly, whilst the governor was yet to be impeached. Uh, of course, we know that that impeachment is still a subject of legal contestation uh, in, in the High Court right now. But um, that letter of resignation was allegedly submitted uh, when that governor, and I'm talking about Governor Murutalan Yaku, was still in office. And so uh, the purported acceptance of that letter of resignation and uh, the declaration of the office of the deputy governor as vacant to enable the speaker, who obviously was the chief beneficiary of the orchestrated uh, impeachment process in Adama State, uh, to then come in as an acting governor was, uh, was uh, not a process that uh, was constitutionally valid. And so uh, the court had no hesitation in, in declaring it uh, invalid. However, but let, me, let, let me ask you, let, let me just ask you this, sorry to cut in. Some people have said, well, sometimes it's necessary that the court looks at the intent of the letter and not the procedure. D d do you share that sentiment that that's what the court should have done? Just look at the intent that uh, the intent is that th this man actually resigned. You no, know, you see, the procedure is as important as the intent. When you look at the Constitution, uh, the Constitution is a super legislation of procedures, basically, um, you know, uh, given time, given situations in which certain steps have to be taken. So, uh, if the procedural steps that ought to have been taken weren't taken or followed uh, the intent or intention of uh, the deputy government uh, regarding the issue of uh, resignation will no longer matter. Uh, if we were to trump procedure, uh, the entire democratic edifice, or we call it civil uh, rule edifice, will collapse because, as I've said, the constitution is uh, a, a green norm of procedures. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, if these procedures weren't followed, uh, uh, playing 
using a judicial soothsayer to discover the intent mm -hmm. will, be, will, be, will not be correct. And so uh, the court was apparently right in looking at um, that letter of resignation, uh, the authority to whom it was submitted, vis-a-vis -vis what the Constitution provides, and to make that declaration that it made. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Lee Rose, in the studio. Um, uh, for you, was, was anything abnormal with this judgment? Um, nothing really, because uh, it, it was very easy and convenient for um, the PDP to find um, a legal solution to a politi political problem they had created. And so, um, and then also, if you, if you listen to the fact of the matter, that um, the letter was actually, the speaker actually went to collect the letter from um, the then deputy governor, now the governor. And, um, you know, looking at the intent of the Constitution, Section 306, Subsection 5, that says um, that um, if a deputy governor wants to resign, he should address a letter to... Um, the governor, and that resignation shall not take effect until it is received and acted upon by the person to whom it is addressed. That's subsection 2 of section 306. And so if, as at the time, the re purported resignation letter was acted upon, there was a sitting governor, can you say for sure that the man that acted upon it had the power to so do? It's like saying you want to resign. Uh, you are a director in an organization, and for you to resign, you must send a resignation letter to the chairman. And now you do a resignation letter and send it to the cook. Does the cook have the powers to act upon that letter? If he does not act the, have the power to act upon it and he acted upon it, what it means is that the purported resignation, would, the, that letter itself, is a mere piece of paper. And that is the way the court has treated it. That's it because if you stretch the argument further, the... Um, Governor, who was to act upon the letter, still has the discretion in the matter. He can decide to accept or to reject uh, the letter. And if, as at 8 a.m., 9 a.m., when the letter was acted upon, there was still a sitting governor in Adamawa, the sitting governor was in pitch as at past 10, and so the deputy, the speaker that acted upon that letter, had no, so, no such powers to, do, to so do. And in, the, in that position, when the court now decided that the, you don't have the power to act upon a letter that was not meant for you in the first place, and before the governor was impeached, and if after the governor was impeached, the, in the eye of the law, there was still a deputy governor, what it means is that by virtue of the constitutional provision, that once the, governor should have taken exactly, over the, governor. the deputy governor would take over the position immediately. And so basically that is what the court has done. And that's why... Um, uh, nobody is finding fault in all of this, even though you would say that um, it's um, a problem that had been, you know, a, a solution has been provided legally, but yet you, you look at it and you can't fault it. Uh, you know? uh, let, let me come back to you, uh, Mr. Ogunye. Um, the, the, acting gov the former acting governor, I should say, of course, is reverted to the position of the speaker now, has said he's, he's going to court, that he's, he's going to challenge it in court. Do you think he has... Uh, you know, some very credible grounds for appeal in this case. You know, um, notionally, uh, every judgment of court, who is the court that delivers judgment, is not the final court of appeal, uh, can be appealed. And, and so uh, the speaker has a consumer right of appeal. And so if you decide to appeal the judgment, um, the Court of Appeal will be there to decide the merit of his case. But speaking for myself, uh, I don't see uh, what is going to appeal against. Um, hey, let, let me look at it this way. What happened in, in Adana State, uh, you know, by the benefit of hindsight, even when some people then were thinking about probity and accountability, I mean, a lot of guys were uh, alarmed that uh, the government uh, was, uh, you know, uh, uh, practicing the Buddhism as alleged and all that. Uh, but, you know, when you then look back at the situation, it's very clear that uh, there was an orchestrated impeachment move by 
uh, the past that be in the PDP from Abuja, coordinated from Abuja. And uh, every attempt that was made to propitiate uh, Abuja, you know, failed, you know, because the governor was asked to go and apologize and come back to the PDP, and he refused. Uh, and so that orchestration uh, was now in sync with the ambitions of local politicians who are also envious of the position of uh, the executive and who also want to fill that position themselves. Uh, and so, uh, prone to, there was a that impeachment. And as liberals has also explained to us, uh, the speaker, you know, was the one who then left the office of the speaker, left uh, the legislative uh, chambers to go to the deputy governor to procure that letter because he was eager, obviously, to occupy an office. And so, he really did the job of a speaker who presided over an impeachment. The next thing that he did, you know, on the same day was to change his uh, barbaranga and now was now more flamboyant and he was, he was, um, he, he was sworn in. So, uh, if you look at that situation, you then come to the conclusion that, uh, yes, ambition can run very fast. Uh, it can be consummated uh, in the most mischievous manner. Uh, but the rule of law always has a way of catching up with reckless okay. ambition. Like I'm, that. I'm, so I'm, for I'm me, going to come back to you. Uh, whether the, the speaker, who is not the speaker, is going to go to court or not, I don't know what he wants to go on. And we need to call it okay, liberals. I mean, the, the speaker has come out to say the the deputy governor actually resigned at the time, and that um, that the former governor, the impeached governor, had actually decided to appoint a member of the state house of assembly as the deputy at the time. So that uh, that that's enough grounds for him to appeal. A it is not the issue here is who was the uh, resignation letter addressed to and who acted on the resignation letter the the former governor was in court because and he, he said he was saying the former governor actually knew that the speed the, the, whether he resigned. knew whether he knew or not is not the issue here the former governor was in court and testified that he did not receive any letter of resignation. And so if he did not re receive a letter of resignation, what it means is that his um, deputy had not resigned. And so whether it was in, in the intention of parties that, okay, you will resign, will appoint somebody from the assembly, that is not known to us. And that is not known to law. The question the law is looking at is, what is the procedure for resignation? And if the man had not complied with the position procedure for resignation, you cannot validly say that the man had resigned. And basically, that is just the position. And so, even if you now say, like um, the issue of uh, wanting to appeal that you asked, the, that is, it's only here that people assume, you know, um, political office as an extension of personal estate. If you understand that you are to get, keep that office. That office. You, I don't see any reason why you should not begin to see it as, oh, the man resigned. But because it wasn't so, the man, like GT just explained, you know, was so much in a hurry to assume the position of acting governor. He went, hurriedly procured a, a, a letter from the deputy, assumed the position of the governor, acted on the letter, before now impeaching the governor, and then now wearing the garb of uh, an acting governor. And so now saying, and also constitutionally, even that robe of an acting governor that you are wearing, it is because there is a lacuna, and the people didn't vote, vote for, for, you for you as an acting governor. And so that is why the... Um, law allows you to act to give the electoral body the time within which to prepare for an election. And if that same, by virtue of um, that um, act or omission, mm -hmm. the court now has said, well, you, there was no need for you to even act in the first place because there was a deputy governor who had a, a, a singular ticket with the governor, so he should be the one to have taken over the mantle of leadership, are you announcing, no, the man resigned, I must act. And even be that as it may, also your tenure for acting will lapse by very, today, today that we're talking it, it, about. Exactly. And so what it means is that even if you go to the Court of Appeal to fight, fight over what? 
a, a position that is not yours, that cannot be yours because you have served out that. Well, this man has tasted that, that position I, and knows it's you, sweet. That, you know, it's uh, probably waiting for, uh, hoping that elections will be conducted and then he will stay there till May and then thereafter probably con contest another election. I, that, that's why all of these all, um, all right. shenanigans is. Gentlemen, doing. let us turn our attention now to something else. Over the week, um, we heard about the 9.3 million cash for arms scandal and um, is still generating a lot of controversy as we speak and uh, of course the Nigerian government has come out to say it actually authorized that transaction and um, yeah just a few days ago we heard about another deal again involving about five point something million dollars and uh, the Nigerian government too saying it authorized that uh, arms deal um, what what do you make of this? I mean, it, it, how embarrassing could this uh, is this for Nigeria? I'm asking you, GT, because I mean, for South Africa to to confiscate, um, well, what the Nigerian government has come out to say was a legal deal, that is not cricket at all, is it? No, it's very embarrassing. Uh, it just means that uh, South Africa is teaching us once more. Um, you know, the etiquette of uh, public morality uh, and how to behave in, in government. So it's very embarrassing for me uh, as a Nigerian. But, you know, the posture of government is not helping matters. Uh, Nigeria is a country, historically, that is notorious for money laundering. Now, this is our country. We're not proud to say it, but that's the truth. Billions and billions of dollars have been stashed away out of this country. And all the people that uh, you know, uh, held the reign of government at the highest level uh, in Nigeria have left office richer, almost all of them, richer than when uh, they went in. So there is a presumption of uh, uh, guilt, not presumption of innocence, that uh, if you go into government, you are going there to loot and uh, until the contrary is proved, uh, in the public estimation and perception, we are just looting. Now, when a country that is espousing the reasonableness of cashless economy is now carrying cash, cash, 9.3 is a lot of money. It is. To South Africa to say that it wants to buy arms. Why would there be a suspicion that that money is a subject of money laundering. And so what the South Africans did, basically, uh, is that they followed their own rule of law. Uh, there was suspicion. They went to court, obtained an order. This is very significant. Obt they just didn't seize the money. Obtained an order for a temporary asset for future. And they then started investigating. If at the end of the investigation they discover that this money is proceeds of crime, of course they will confiscate the money, you know, uh, uh, fully. So what the Nigerian government should do, instead of staying in Nigeria and grandstanding and threatening MTN and threatening uh, DSTV, it's even silly, is to raise a legal team and a diplomatic team, perhaps led by Dazuku's claim that he was the one who authorized it, and then go to South Africa. This is legit. This is properly done and all that. Yes, in our country, or the international law, is plausible or reasonable to carry tons of cash on your head to say that you want to go and do transaction <laughs> in another foreign country. Go there and explain this to South Africans. Exactly. And South Africans will listen. Now, you can't stay in Nigeria and say that, yes, uh, it was good for you to have, uh, you know, in prison in Rianca, for example, and you are the chief beneficiary. Yeah, they are saying that, yeah, it was properly done because the Rianca somehow was convicted on behalf of the Nigerian government in a way. So they say it was perfectly okay. But now, South Africa has seized their money. They are now saying that it's not okay. That South Africa is embarrassing them. South Africa is an enemy territory. In fact, they send their sidekicks to television stations to explain how bad South Africa is, how South Africa is envious of Nigeria because we have rebased our economy. All sorts of bad <laughs> And so for me, they are compounding the embarrassment by this jejuing and ignorant and 
silly, silly explanation and, and rationalization. And for me, as a Nigerian, I, I feel very embarrassed. Let, let's just take, really? we're going to take a short break here. When we come back, I'll be getting uh, the opinion of Libero Shoshoma on this uh, very controversial issue. Don't go away. <laughs> 